Thank you, Frank, and welcome, everybody. My name is Adrienne Opre. I feel like uh, Premier McKenna is like that double shot of espresso. <laughs> you get me your coffee every morning. We got to have that on YouTube, and we got to play that every day. So thank you so much. And I just want to say thank you to all of you being here. You know, when you talk about your throne speech and uh, how things change over time, you know, whether it's, uh, if it's government, if it's policy, all these things change. One of the things that stood out for me when you said that is that one of the things that doesn't change is passionate citizenry. And that's what we have here, and that's what all of you are. And I also want to welcome our guests from outside of Atlantic Canada today. Thank you so much for being here. Um, as, as you mentioned, the Atlantic Immigration Pilot, um, having the Public Policy Forum, leading this conversation and bringing Atlantic Canada together here in New Brunswick today, these are all part of that passionate citizenry that you are all a part of, and uh, I'm just really proud to be uh, in the room with all of you today and to welcome all of you. So thanks very much. So, um, and Ed, you talked about uh, don't defy the whip. Well, that's my job today. <laughs> I'm a different kind of whip today. And so my role today is sort of move us through uh, in a timely fashion. And uh, the idea is to ensure that you get as much time as possible listening to this fabulous roster of speakers and guests that we have here today and that you have an opportunity to be part of the conversation. So, um, so without further ado, I want to get us started. We have an excellent, excellent group of people to speak with us today. And the first person I'd like to introduce is Dr. Uh, Herb Emery, who is the Vaughn Chair in Regional Economics at the University of New Brunswick. And uh, Herb and I, in the short time that he's been here, he uh, joined us from Calgary, I think a couple of years ago, isn't that right, Herb? Uh, we've had the chance to work together, and I have to say, I'm, uh, I was so pleased to see him on the agenda today. He's been so active in our community here, uh, speaking on several issues, uh, and always bringing such a, an interesting perspective. And I always wish there was the herb pill that you could take and just have uh, half the, the knowledge and intelligence that he brings, so I'm still searching for the, for the herb pill. But he is an absolute gem, uh, and, and, f and we, we are taking full advantage of having him here uh, in New Brunswick and in the Atlantic region, and I'm so excited to uh, hear his address today. So with that, uh, Herb, if you could join us at, uh, at the podium and get us started. Thank you. Uh, yeah, herb pill is an interesting concept. My kids and family would probably tell you that wouldn't be an antidepressant, it would be a depressant. Um, now, a couple of things going, it's great that David Foote's book was brought up because that book was written around 1996. And so if we really think through the demographic crisis that is Canada-wide but more complacent elsewhere, we have the excitement of being incredibly embarrassed that we're being run over by a glacier. We've been watching it come and it's saying it's getting closer, we don't need to worry about it, and it's here. And one of the problems that we're dealing with is how do we get out of the conundrum? And there's a lot of discussion about immigration, and with the discussion I'm going to have today, there's a couple of messages. No matter what we do, immigration is important, even if you take from my message that I'm kind of down on immigration as a sole solution. And immigration needs to be part of a suite of policy approaches, it's not a standalone. And if we don't think about creating opportunity along with the immigration, then we're going to be solving a different problem than we think we are because immigration is going to be difficult to use as a driver of growth in a small open economy. And I want to go through some of that logic. So the nice, I also want to give credit to uh, Charlie, who I think came up with the maritime idea of a tidy knot. Uh, it kind of brings it together, but it's a nice concept that I want to walk you through how an economist would think about this challenge, about how do we grow a population and then how does that relate to uh, economic growth in two contexts. One is a closed economy, which is how we teach most students in Canada today, which is not the Canadian economy or New Brunswick. And then I want to go back to an older model that we used to teach, which is the small open economy, which has completely different implications for immigration and population. So one way to think of this is does the regional economy or New Brunswick have a population growth problem or does the population have an economic growth problem? So in the one case, the economy needs more population to grow. In the other case, the population is stagnant because there's no growth going on. And we have to decide which of these problems we're actually trying to solve and which one we're actually suffering from. 
Now, let's start off with the first one. Suppose the economy has a population growth, suppose the economy has a population problem. The challenge here is where do we find the population, the skills, and the human capital that the economy needs to grow? So I would describe this as when I was living in Alberta. This was the problem we were trying to deal with. The economy is growing rapidly. We can't find enough people to fill the positions. And so a lot of what was going on with settlement services was trying to take professionals who couldn't get accreditation and get them moved into something where they work to their full skill level. Now, is it the same case that this would work in a place like New Brunswick, where we don't have growth as the thing initiating the driver in the first place, where we have the population problem? Now, for immigration, one of the hardest challenges is figuring out who is actually an immigrant to New Brunswick. You'll have statistics that are based on where did the immigrants say they were going to go, but they don't actually go there. And so what I've done is I've used statistics from tax filing information. You had to file taxes in New Brunswick at least in the year you landed. And then I look at where you are five years later in the same data. And so this graph shows the number of immigrants by year of entry cohort. So each point along the x-axis is a different year of entry. And what you see is that the number of immigrants in New Brunswick filing taxes at least one year has gone up from about 300 to around 1,400. And after five years, New Brunswick retains about 80% of them if they landed in New Brunswick, but about 90% of immigrants that landed anywhere in Canada and eventually came to New Brunswick. So if they file taxes in New Brunswick, we have a high retention rate. So this kind of points to if there's 3,000 immigrants saying that New Brunswick was the intended destination, they didn't file tax. So either this is family members or this is the opportunity. How do you increase the initial attraction and create the opportunities to stay. The other side of the equation is that we don't have an immigrant retention problem, we have a population retention problem. This is the number of annual out migrants by age group from New Brunswick to anywhere else in Canada. And what you can see from the blue in particular, those are young New Brunswickers, 18 to 24. We lose about anywhere from 1,500 to 2,000 of them per year. If you think through the implications of that out-migration of your future skills to other regions of Canada, this has to be part of the solution. How do you keep more of these young New Brunswickers in the province? So we can talk about immigration, but what we're really talking about is backfilling for this exodus. With the levels we have now of around 1,000, we're keeping some, but we're just replacing a lot of the workers that are going out that we could have used. And some of it might be expedience. The immigrants have more experience and the skills we need right away, so they can backfill right away. But if we make the investment in retention here, maybe we don't need as many immigrants initially, but we can grow as the economy starts to get its kickstart back. But if we want to completely replace this, we need 1,000 more immigrants filing taxes in New Brunswick per year in the entry cohorts. So it's a big increase in the numbers that we need, but don't forget about the opportunity about immigrant retention. And recessions in Alberta are actually very good for New Brunswick, so what we're seeing with the pipeline problems is that Justin Trudeau might be doing us a solid by keeping more New Brunswickers here. Now, suppose that the population has an economic growth problem. In this case, immigration, population retention, and population growth will all increase if we increase labor demand. In other words, immigration is not a solution to anything, it's the response to solving the problem. And when I th what I want to put in your heads here is Saskatchewan, which up until 2005 also had no population growth, losing lots of its population in neighboring Alberta in particular, and having serious problems like population aging. After 2005 with the commodity super cycle and all the investment that came in in labor demand, Within 10 years, they've grown to about 1.2 million population and they reversed population aging. This is not a long-term process. This is a bang-bang solution when you get labor demand and opportunities up. And I'll, I think I have a cryptic graph showing that. Now, how do economists think about this? If you, ask a, if you randomly select an economist in the Canadian Economics Department, they will tell you a closed economy story about how population and labor supply affects growth. And in this case, if it's a closed economy, as I'll walk through, the implications are that if you're not dependent on trade and all of your inputs, capital and labor, come from domestic supplies, and then you're allowed to parachute in some immigration, what happens here is that adding population does grow GDP, and what it also does is it raises labor productivity because you get more capital per worker in some sense. So population aging should also be accompanied by rising output per worker. 
and that's how you pay for the aging population. If you're in a situation where you don't see population aging causing labor productivity to rise, you're not in this economy. We've got something else to worry about, which I'll get to next. So in this case, all of your capital comes from domestic savings. Savings equals investment, so if you don't consume as much, you get more capital to produce. So when you have a young population, they're consuming out of labor income, they're putting money away for when they're old. And when your population gets older, you become a glutted in capital because everyone's living off of their savings. And so this is where the productivity shifts start to come in. Wages and interest rates in these economies depend upon the amount of capital per worker. If there's more capital per worker, wages are high and interest rates are low. So as the capital stock goes up, we should see higher and higher wages, higher and higher productivity, but lower and lower rates to capital. So we know that these are the adjustments we should see if population growth is going to do anything for the economy, but that's not New Brunswick. And some colleagues have recently done an interesting study in the economy I'm about to tell you about, which points out that our treatment of capital in this economy is likely translating into $2 lower per hour wages for workers. So in some sense, when we think about a closed economy, we select policies that are a disincentive divestment, and the main payers of that are the labor supply, and this could be why attraction and retention becomes a problem. So we need to think about investment. In this setting, labor and capital are mobile to other markets, which means your wages and your interest rates return to capital are set outside of the region. So when workers go to ask you, can I have a job, they're not just looking at you, they're looking at what can I get in Toronto. And if you can't match Toronto, then they go. So what we have is a problem that we don't set the wage rates in this market. The other dominant markets will are the alternative sectors. And the effectively what happens in this is the capital labor ratio in the small open economy can't change. Because of the arbitrage condition, wages and interest rates are always set to the same capital labor ratio. If you deviate from that, you either lose population if your wage gets too low or if your interest rates get too low, capital goes out, the return to capital. On the other side, if you get a higher return to capital, capital comes in and that will draw more labor in. So what you get instead of the other economy, which is adjusting on productivity, what you get here is if you add population without capital, you just displace workers who are already here. And so this is the conundrum in the small open economy. You have to have a capital strategy along with uh, the labor supply. It's also the case that what drives growth in this economy is export demand. If you have more demand for what you produce, you get more investment. That draws in more labor. And so it's really the export sector that initiates all of the growth in this economy. And this is frustrating for Canadians to think about because we don't want to be hewers of wood and drawers of water. We want to be something else like the United States, not dependent on exports, self-sufficient, and we don't need the export sector and we just have our population. That's not the reality in a small province. So the main impacts of export growth are going to be a larger GDP, a larger population, and higher property values on your real estate. And so what happens in this economy is you still won't see in the long run any change in the wage rate or the return to capital. So the symptoms of growth are completely different than the closed economy, which is what we spend most of the time in the media talking in terms of. Now, in a small open economy, it's the place, not the people. We did a study of New Brunswickers who went out to Alberta. Some of them stayed out there and some came back. What we learned about looking at the ones who came back is that they earned just as much as the ones who went west and stayed, but when they came back, they earned half as much as they were earning out west. So the same workers are worth double in another economy. So there's nothing wrong with the New Brunswick labor. It's the context that they're coming into just doesn't value the human capital they have as highly as some of the other economies. So in this context, we have to worry about how do we get the capital labor ratio up in order that we can get more population coming in. So if the same workers is worth, out, worth more outside, we have to think about why is that the case. So most research that's coming out recently is pointing towards labor demand as the driver of population growth. So exhibit one from Statistics Canada this year by Rene Morissette is the scatter plot up top, and it looked at Canada's economic, uh, Statistics Canada's economic regions. And what he correlates is that wherever you see labor demand rising first, you get more population growth. So in other words, capital and export demands, which is driving a lot of this, is what's driving the population growth to the region, and immigration is part of that. Exhibit two 
is Saskatchewan, which is the line that was flat in that ugly little uh, line plot below, that suddenly turns up, and then that's at 2005, and then the slightly dashed bar is taking it out to 2037, and you can see that Saskatchewan has resolved its population growth problem as long as export demand remains high for what they produce. Potash, oil, gas, uranium, and I think the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. <laughs> and then the third item is coming out of recently from the United States. This is from Larry Summers and Ed Glazer and Austin. And what they're looking at is the U.S. male non-employment rate by uh, county in the United States. And what they learned from that is that wherever manufacturing has gone into decline, you get a higher non-employment rate that's persistently high and you lose convergence in incomes across counties and states. Their solution to it is you have to think about how do you stimulate labor demand in order to get that labor activated back into producing GDP again. But again, the focus isn't so much on how do we grow the population, it's about how do you stimulate labor demand. If labor demand is stimulated, you get the population growth. That's what Saskatchewan shows. They didn't have to do much in the way and just get out of the way of the inflow of population coming in after 2005. And if you watch the rate of home building and the appreciation in home values, you could actually see how rapidly that occurs. It was an overheated economy. Now, is there any evidence that there's weaker demand for labor in New Brunswick? Well, if we look at, these are series I've done with a colleague, David Morell. This takes private sector investment and public sector investment and nets out residential construction. And so what we're looking at is the change in the physical capital stock year on year, uh, which would, we would think would be for business type enterprises as opposed to just building houses. And what we see is that over time, New Brunswick and Nova Scotia actually weren't faring too badly compared to the rest of Canada. But since 2011, there's been almost no increase in the net size of the capital stock in New Brunswick or Nova Scotia. The private sector investment rate is about 1% per year. So as a result of that, if you look at the rest of Canada, it's up at around 6 to 8%. And in New Brunswick, what we have is a public sector investment rate that currently equals the private sector. So we're trying to offset weak private sector investment with public sector investment. And this could be why we're struggling to create some of those jobs. Now, if you look at the rest of Canada, where does their investment come from? This is by broad industry. <clears throat> the importance isn't going to be a surprise of mining, which is really oil and gas for Canada. This is now coming down. So Canada's investment rate may also be falling. But you also see an importance of utilities, which could include pipelines and things like that in this case. So what Canada has been living off of as their manufacturing investment has been in trend decline is the resource sector out west has been keeping Canada afloat in terms of investment. If we look at Nova Scotia, which is farthest to my right, and New Brunswick, which is a bit closer, what you'll see is the deflation of manufacturing investment over the last few decades to the point since 2011, there really hasn't been any net addition to the manufacturing capital stock, also really true in Nova Scotia as well. And we're also using utilities, which has been a big driver of investment uh, in the provinces. So what we're looking at is we have flat labor demand because we don't have the investment coming through the private sector that we need to get the success that we've been seeing where newcomers are pouring in by large numbers. So we need to think about how do we get investment in order to get that population growth coming. So if the population has an economic growth problem, human capital policies alone have a property of it's like pushing on a rope. You can't push growth in a small open economy just by adding labor. The regional economy needs investment to stimulate labor demand. That will attract immigrants, retain young New Brunswickers, and it will grow the population. And for investment, we need exports, right? Which means we need to ensure our producers are competitive. So it's a different discussion we're having in addition to immigration. And as I get all the time, this is pretty obvious. So the next question is, well, how would we do it? And so that's what I'm hoping the rest of other conferences will come up with. I'll state the obvious like a good academic and I'll leave the details to someone else. <laughs> now, I'll finish with this. A stagnant economy is an economy with a population problem. Immigration and immigrant retention seem so important to New Brunswick and the broader region because it often comes across as what other options do we have? I often come across people who say the resource sector's over, we can't rely on that in New Brunswick, the traditional sectors aren't there anymore, we just have a new reality, we need some kind of new sector, but in the meantime, we just need more people. 
So, and that's true. If we can't grow the economy, we do have to worry about we're losing skills throughout migration. We need to replace those in order to keep things going. But it's a different problem than causing growth. It's also viewed, I think, quite often, it's easier to stimulate and manage immigration and population than it is to deal with investment. Because for many Canadians, politically, investment's a mystery. They don't know why it comes and goes. They don't know why some companies are big and others are small. And they really like high-tech stuff right now, so that's sort of the new darling. Um, it's also, it's hard to reverse the out-migration because we've spent decades getting rid of surplus population in Canadian provinces. We have education systems which are not oriented around keeping population present. It was really helping populations adjust to economic realities. So when your unemployment rate is extremely high, you have an education system that educates and incents young population to move to a place where there's more opportunity. And so there's not a big attempt to retain young population. So some of our thinking has to revert, not just around immigrant retention, but also how do we train for the skills we need in the economy now as opposed to the general human capital which is in demand in Toronto. So maybe less business training, more vocational skills training for emerging industrial needs. And finally, in a stagnant economy, immigration provides an option value for hope. In particular, entrepreneurial newcomers, of which there are many, and because Canadian history is based on entrepreneurial newcomers, it's like winning the lottery if some of them land in your province and decide they like it here, and they create the new industry and the new opportunity. And that's really important to always keep in mind, is that every time you have a cohort come in, you may have the next Gretzky of business or an industry. And that's why immigration will always be important, whether they're coming in because you have growth or whether you're bringing them in because you need to backfill and you have some needs in the meantime. So the other thing we have to remember with newcomers is that we're hoping they'll see opportunities that we don't in our economy, and we're hoping they t take risks that we're not prepared to take. And that's another value of newcomers that you often see. And the last one I'll finish with is because newcomers get treated so roughly in Canada, I was at, involved in a research program about how their resilience is actually an asset for the Canadian economy. Their persistence in the face of tough conditions is something that a lot of Canadians haven't shown over the last few decades. And so the more we can get newcomers, the better off we'll be. But if we want growth, let's talk about newcomers and opportunity. And I'll leave it there. So I've been told to manage my own traffic control. I see one question up on the screen already. Yeah, uh, do you see differences among the provinces in how they are trying to increase export growth? Any most effective policy? Well, the obvious one is pipelines. So out west, if you go to Alberta and Saskatchewan, it's all about getting their raw resources to market. Because if they can get, if they can reduce the spread in price between the U.S. price of oil and what they get, the Edmonton Par price, that raises the value that they get to keep in the province. So if they can get access to Tidewater and get a higher price, that's effectively increasing your export demand. That will draw in more population because there will be more investment in the projects and everything else. When you come across Canada to the east where there's less interest in pipelines and these big utility projects, you start to see instead we prefer not to exploit our natural resource base. We're going to look for something else. But that's a case of where... Out west, after the 1990s, the decision was everything's about investment and population will follow, and all policy was focused on making sure that it was a good place to invest. The frustration with the current government in Alberta is that they don't understand business, and what they're doing is they're undoing the competitive advantages, and they're going to lose out, but now the NDP is coming around, and they're all in on pipelines. So that's the most obvious one. Uh, question two. This is like an exam. How do export of services compare to exports of products and driving employment growth? I don't think we need to distinguish across categories of exports as long as the revenue or value comes to the, comes to the province and that's where the head office is and that's where the taxes are paid. So if you're exporting a service, that's no different than exporting a widget in my mind in terms of the bottom line on growth. It's just you have a sector that's going to have different productivity characteristics, say, than manufacturing. But we shouldn't be so hung up on which exports are growing. We just want more exports, more value added, and that will draw in more opportunity. 
questions from the audience? I'm reading an actual question. I think the research is fascinating. Um, um, but like a lot of academic research, I can't say that I agree with all of it. <laughs> um, to start with, there's no doubt capital investment in our, in our region is, is impaired. Um, but we're not able to get mines sighted. We're not able to get uh, gas lifted. We're not able to get pipelines built. I mean, I mean the impediments to a resource producing area are, are considerable here, the regulatory environment, the political environment. Um, so that is difficult. But we've had to consider what you've talked about now for 20 years, and it's a chicken and an egg thing. That is, do we need the growth and then the immigrants, or do we need the immigrants and then the growth? And it strikes me as, as odd uh, when you would stress so much that we need the economic growth, because we've got 25,000 jobs unfilled at the present time, and by 2020, we'll have 50,000 jobs unfilled. And this is all to do with growth, uh, whether it's uh, uh, fellow forwarders in, in the forest, or whether it's factory jobs, or whatever it is. Every industry in our region needs workers, and they can expand and grow, and then apply capital if they don't have the workers. So I would suggest that it may be a little bit of each, but we, we, we just can't sit around and wait for growth because the growth depends on workers, and right now we're short of workers. That's a really good point, and the causal direction is difficult. I've obviously been using a theoretical model to say which way I think it should go, and then looking for symptoms. So on the labor shortage issue, the first thing I would want to look at is what's happening to wage rates where those shortages are, and we've been doing some of this with ICT. Is there any evidence that wage rates are rising which would signal a shortage? One of the challenges in New Brunswick, even if we want to just, let's ignore the whole growth argument. But let's say that we have these shortages, why can't we fill them? The question I keep asking when I go around is, why can't wages rise in New Brunswick if there's a shortage? To signal to skills in the rest of Canada or New Brunswickers thinking of leaving that could invest in a training program, why aren't they going into it? Because we're not seeing the wage rate going up if they invest. So there's something that's impairing the adjustment of the labor market, which I think is why we're seeing these persistent shortages, the vacancies uh, that are unfilled. And so if we, have a, if we have an efficiency problem with the adjustment of the labor market, we need to address that, and immigration is definitely an avenue we can do that. Because if we can't find a Canadian or a New Brunswicker who's willing to work at the current wage rate in that job, or who will invest in getting the skills through a training program, maybe we can find an immigrant who's prepared to take it at that wage rate. And working in the university, I can tell you, we can't pay market rate. We can't attract <laughs> native-born New Brunswickers. They're getting drawn off elsewhere, but we can find newcomers that are struggling to find work in the New Brunswick economy. And so what we're able to do is we can hire them at a wage we can pay in the university for a research assistant. They get a bit more training, and then our goal is they'll get poached by someone else who needs those skills. So I think that the reality you're talking about is there. The puzzle for me is why aren't the wages rising, which would resolve that shortage? And that's where I think we could do a lot more policy work. Well, on the screen, last question. How can you attract capital for labor demand when capital cannot see assured labor supply? Is there evidence that capital will blaze a trail? I can only point to Saskatchewan again that capital came first and the population came in rapidly. But again, as uh, Premier McKenna has pointed out, economists have many hands, the one hand, the other hand, and the third hand. What I'm relying on is I've got some evidence from studying a particular economy out west. I'm just learning about the New Brunswick economy now. If I were betting, I would bet on investment first bringing in the population, but I've been wrong on many things in my life, so that's why we're going to have a great conference. But again, investment is always going to be critical to your growth. If you look at why some economies are rich and others are poor, the biggest difference is the amount of capital per worker in those economies. High-income economies are capital-intensive, low-income economies are labor-intensive. And if we can figure out ways, whether it's through greater productivity, through automation, greater opportunities through just improving efficiency in our industries, access to market, 
resolving regulatory burdens and things like that, there may be opportunity to get more investment into the region and resolve a lot of these issues. Uh, but I know there's going to be a lot of great discussion on immigration, so I appreciate your indulging me on talking about capital and investment. I just didn't want it to be a missing piece of the uh, overall equation. But thank you very much.